short chapter today. We're going to tackle chapter 13, secondary data and content analysis. Okay. Uh, three primary benefits to using secondary data, uh, conceptual substantive benefits. Secondary data are sometimes the only data available for the study of certain research problems. Uh, social and political historians, for example, must rely almost exclusively on secondary data given the nature of their research. Uh, so if we were dealing with a, a population that, that had no written language, uh, we would have to, to rely on um, information from uh, individuals that had observed them uh, when they first uh, uh, when they first made contact uh, because there wouldn't you wouldn't be able to uh, interact with with that population especially if you couldn't speak their language and whatnot secondary data can also be used for purposes of comparison Comparisons within and between uh, nations or social groups may expand the scope of generalizations and provide additional insights into events and processes. In some cases, attempting to collect primary data can be dangerous or unethical. Uh, ooh, wait a minute. Uh, let's do that. Okay. Methodological benefits. Uh, first, secondary data, if reliable and accurate, uh, provide opportunities for replication. Second, the availability of data collected at different points in time enables the researcher to employ longitudinal research designs. Third, secondary analysis may improve the validity of measurement by expanding the scope of the independent variables employed when operationalizing major concepts. Fourth, by using secondary data, we can increase the sample size, its representativeness, and the number of observations. Factors that contribute to more uh, encompassing generalizations. Finally, secondary data can be used for triangulation, uh, the use of different kinds of data to, to, to uh, test the same hypothesis, thereby increasing the validity of the findings obtained from primary data. Cost primary research is, costly under, is a costly undertaking. Conducting a nationally representative uh, survey is sometimes prohibitively expensive for university professors, independent researchers, and graduate students, especially in light of increasing cutbacks in research support and funding opportunities. It is infinitely less expensive to use existing data than to collect new primary data. Methodolog methodological advantages it provides opportunities for replication. It allows for longitudinal research designs. It may improve the uh, ability, the validity of, of measurement. It can increase the, the sample size, its representativeness, and the number of observations. It can be used for triangulation. Limitations often only approximate uh, the kinds, approximate the kinds of, of data that the investigator would like to employ for testing hypothesis. Limited access to data sets, uh, which often must be uh, bought to gain access. Uh, insufficient knowledge of how the secondary data was collected in order to find potential sources of bias, errors, or problems with internal and external validity. This is a picture of one of the first computers. As you can see, it's massive. Uh, it was used during World War II to try to break codes. Uh, and as you can see, there's a, a lot of... Uh, vacuum tubes uh, that are part of this computer. Uh, this was one that was uh, utilized in England, an English military. Uh, guidelines to locating useful data, specify your needs, uh, clearly identify and define the theories and concepts of interest, desired operationalizations, and measures and potential sources of bias. Know the material, Identify and use keywords and phrases to search library catalogs and holdings, data archives, and the internet more uh, generally to familiarize yourself with the types of secondary data available. Secure the data. Get in touch with local experts who are familiar with each secondary data source. Use these contacts to field and answer questions to obtain any relevant permissions for securing the data and to develop new contacts. Begin the analyses. Uh, pour over the data. View clean and, and conduct several conduct several initial inquiries to get your feet wet in using these data. 
Repeat this process until you are familiar with the data and ready to conduct your analysis. Secondary data contains what are referred to as unobtrusive measures, also known as non-reactive measures. The researcher has no influence on the conditions under which the data were collected. Two broad classes of unobtrusive measures, erosion measures, signs left after use of an object, for example, the wear on a library book is a marker of its popularity, and accretion measures uh, ca capture the buildup versus erosion of human activity. In this case, researchers e examine remnants that are suggestive of potential behaviors. Uh, an example would be how many people have signed a library card, for example, for a select book. That's the way they used to do it. Now, now you don't. You don't write anything down. But in the old days, uh, each card had a pocket in it, and, and each pocket had a library card. And if you wanted to check out that book, then you took the library card out, you signed it uh, with the date, and then you handed it to the uh, librarian. And he would stamp it, or he and or she would stamp it. Uh, then they'd stamp the book to tell you when you had to turn it back in. Four basic types of simple observation. Physical sign. Researchers might observe the exterior body of its physical aspects as if they were indicators or signs of behavior patterns and attitudes. Examples of such measures are tattoos, hairstyles, clothing, ornamental items such as jewelry and other objects. Expressions. A simple analysis of uh, expressive movement requires researchers to focus on the self expressive features of the body and how these movements indicate social interactions. People communicate feelings and social norms through body language. Locations, the purpose of physical location analysis is to investigate the ways in which individuals use their bodies in a natural occurring social space. A good example of this would be, uh, I used to work at um, uh, Ashford University and it was in an old convent. Um, the curious part was that the steps were really narrow. They were they were quite narrow. Uh, and the reason is because people used to have smaller feet than they do today. So when we were we were uh, checking out the uh, fire escape, uh, which was on the outside of the building, of course you wouldn't do that anymore. Well, maybe you would. Anyway, it was a fire escape and the the, uh, uh, the uh, Steps were about six inches wide, uh, which sounds like a lot, but if you've got a size 12 foot, it's kind of hard to, to do more than tiptoe up and down the steps. It's really kind of interesting. Uh, another example of, of locations, uh, when I was, uh, we were in Peru, and we were at uh, Machu Picchu, uh, and uh, you, can, you can climb to the top of Buena Picchu, which is the tall mountain right behind Machu Picchu, uh, where they used to do ceremonies. And of course, there's a path that goes up there, and it's cut into the uh, uh, into the stone. Um, and, and evidently, and, and this, you see the same thing on the Inca Trail. Uh, these are, are kind of roadways that they built uh, between one place and another. Uh, anyway, whenever there are steps, they were really narrow steps, like three or four inches. Uh, and of course, me and my my big size twelves had a really difficult time getting up the getting up the steps. I had to tiptoe all the way up. It was a little interesting. The people with smaller feet didn't have nearly the same problem that I did because their foot, their entire most of their foot fit on the on the uh, step. But I'm here. I am. I'm tiptoeing my way up uh, up the mountain. Uh, using the, utilizing their steps, uh, which were tiny, which were extremely small, and I complained about it, and uh, and they were just kind of laughing because I'm I'm a little bitty short guy, and I've got really big feet, and they're kind of big people, relatively large, a little bit bigger than I am certainly, and they had like size, you know, six and seven and eight size feet, uh, so evidently I was the one that was the the oddity. Uh, behaviors including language, effective use of language, behavior and analysis and, and analyzing how relationships between people are structured and maintained. I have the same problem in my house right now. This house was built in 1918 <clears throat> and there are steps that go down to the basement and steps that, uh, that go up to the second floor 
the the servant steps that are, it's almost like a ladder it's so so steep but the the st steps are really are relatively narrow and and somebody with with mega feet like I've got have a difficult time going up and down the steps I haven't had any problem I mean I haven't tripped or anything going down up and down the steps but it's just a little bit different my wife doesn't have nearly nearly the problem that I have behaviors including language effective use of language behavior and analyzing how relationships between people are structured and maintained a uh, good example of that is and, and I hate to use this example but in the old days when somebody said they were making love to somebody it didn't mean that they were having sex it meant that they were flirting with them that's that was making love back then of course now it has uh, uh, it means that uh, you're engaging in coitus co uh, to some extent but in the old days it just meant flirting with somebody archival records provide opportunities for unobtrusive uh, uh, data collection partially because they are quite diverse in character public records actuarial records most societies maintain records of births, deaths, marriages, and divorces. Researchers use such actuarial uh, records for both descriptive and explanatory uh, purposes. Electoral, uh, electoral and uh, judicial records, political scientists in particular, make extensive uh, use of legislative and other official records, such as judicial decisions, to study phenomena such as socioeconomic uh, behavior and shifts in political ideologies. Government documents, quasi-public uh, documents, may likewise serve as sources of data. Uh, mass media, the mass media record, uh, records people's uh, communications. Uh, these can be used to study a variety of research topics. Private records, autobiographies, are the most frequently used private record. Uh, they reflect the author's sometimes official interpretation of his or her uh, personal experiences. Uh, the diary is a more spontaneous account as its author tends to be unconstrained by the, the sense of mission that often motivates the writing of autobiographies. Both autobiographies and diaries are initially directed to, the, to a single audience, the author. Letters, in contrast, have a dual audience, the writer and the recipient, from the very outset and often re reflect the interaction between them. One of the major, major issues researchers face in using private records is their authenticity. Two kinds of inauthentic records, records that have been produced by deliberate deceit and records that have been unconsciously misrepresented. Records may be falsified or forged uh, for various purposes, a primary one being prestige or material rewards. A good example is what's going on with uh, the, the uh, uh, investigation of, of January 6th, uh, the insurrection at the Capitol. Um, one side is calling it an insurrection. And the other side is, is, is saying that, oh, it was, it was, there was hardly anything to it. Uh, they're trying to create a new narrative. They're trying to create, well, what the left, what the uh, liberals consider a false narrative. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, conservatives are, are, are trying to, uh, or are saying that uh, the liberals are overstating what happened on January 6th. Ensuring authenticity. First, the researcher needs to examine authorship critically. Uh, second, establish the date of the document and verify the ac uh, accuracy of the dates of the events mentioned. If the writer refers to an event whose timing cannot be corroborated by other documents, the accuracy of the original record should be taken as suspect. Unconscious misrepresentation is much more difficult to detect. Although documents may not be false, they may misrepresent the truth uh, for the following reasons. The authors of letters, diaries, or autobiographies may not clearly remember the facts. They may be trying to please their readers by exaggerating. They may be constrained by social norms and conventions, and thus compelled to uh, present a somewhat distorted picture. Questions to consider for authenticity. Uh, what did the author mean by a particular statement? Is its underlying meaning uh, different from its literal meaning? Was the statement made in good faith? Was the author influenced by sympathy or antipathy? By vanity? By public opinion? Was the statement accurate? Was the author a poor observer because of a, a mental defect or abnormality? Was the author badly situated in time and place to observe 
the event objectively. And you can look at, at anything that's happening today and you can see exactly the same thing. Uh, if you were listening to uh, conservative uh, radio, then you would get one picture. And if you were reading uh, more liberal media, uh, then you would get a totally different picture. Uh, and of course, the same thing has been going on forever. There's, people have their own opinions. Uh, people uh, try to uh, change uh, history uh, by, by state, stating it differently. Uh, and of course, you know, this has always been going on. So you have to be critical of, uh, of what you're reading and what you're looking at. The Internet, uh, what the Internet has done uh, quite simply is to expand accessibility to sources of, of information. In many respects, computers and their peripherals have replaced much of the equipment used to do research. Information, information is becoming handier. Governments and international agencies, such as the World Bank and the United Nations, for example, are steadily making more of their official internal documents, publications, and collected data available on the Internet. A census or, or population enumeration is a collection and recording of demographic data that describes a population in a defined territory and is carried out by a government at a specific time and at regular intervals. In theory, a census is universal and includes every person living in a designated area. The short form is a complete count census designed to reach all U.S. households. Uh, many census data products are, are available on the Census Bureau's website, including those for the 2010 de decennial uh, census. The decennial census contains two forms, a short form and a long form. The short form, a complete count uh, census designed to reach all U.S. households. The long form contains additional questions on other variables collected from a sample of respondents consisting of approximately 17 percent of all households. Among the most common statistical areas are metropolitan statistical areas, uh, or MSAs, and census-designated places, CDPs, and census tracts. MSAs are generally confined as one or more counties, having a large population nucleus plus any surrounding communities with a high degree of interaction. For example, bedroom communities. Uh, we live, I live in Lost Nation, uh, Iowa. Lost Nation, Iowa has, has nothing, there's nothing there but houses. It's, uh, it, it just barely has a downtown. It used to have a school there, but they closed the school. They consolidated it with another school, and now there's no school in town. Uh, so what uh, Lost Nation has become is a bedroom community for Maquoketa and DeWitt. DeWitt is to the south and Maquoketa is to the north. Uh, and Dubuque, I guess, you could drive all the way to Dubuque if you had to. It's only, it's only about 35 miles. So, uh, yeah, it's become a bedroom community. So uh, Lost Nation is part of the uh, DeWitt Maquoketa MSA. CDPs refer to densely settled population centers lacking legally confined corporate limits or powers. Census tracts are small, locally uh, defined statistical areas located within metropolitan areas and some counties. Modern censuses uh, do contain errors that users of population enumerations should be aware of. Errors in coverage refers to the fact that a person or a group is either not counted or is counted twice. Errors in content uh, occurs when information is incorrectly reported and or tabulated. Apart from those errors due to carelessness, errors in content typically occur because persons surveyed may deliberately uh, give inaccurate responses to questions measuring certain variables such as income. Content analysis provides social scientists with a systematic methodology uh, for analyzing the data obtained from many of the types of secondary data sources. Uh, content analysis is the study of recorded human communication. Uh, researchers attempt to guarantee ob objectivity by carrying out their analysis analyses uh, according to explicit rules that enable different investigators to obtain the same results from the same messages or documents, that is, under conditions that permit replication. When conducting systematic content analysis, the inclusion or exclusion of content is done according to consistently applied criteria of selection. This requirement eliminates analyses in which only materials supporting the investigator's hypothesis are examined. 
Content analysis can also be used to explore other elements of communication. A researcher may anal analyze messages to test hypotheses about characteristics of the text. Content analysis is most frequently used in describing the characteristics of messages. Uh, what inspired the message occurs when a text is analyzed in order to make inferences about the sender of the message and about its causes or antecedents. Researchers make inferences about the effects of messages on recipients. The researcher determines the effect of, say, A's message on B by analyzing the content of B's responses. Content analysis involves the interaction of two processes, specification of characteristics of content measured, and application of rules for identifying and recording the characteristics appearing in text analyzed. Recording unit, uh, the smallest body of content or text in which a reference uh, appears and is noted. A reference is a single occurrence of the content element. A, cont a context unit, the largest body of cont content or text that must be examined when characterizing a recording unit. Uh, an example of a recording unit would be uh, every time they say uh, people uh, in the Declaration of Independence, the recording unit would be the word people, and the context unit would be the Declaration of Independence. Five major recording units have been used in content analysis research. Words or terms, the word is the smallest unit generally applied in research. Uh, when the recording unit is a word, the analysis yields a list reporting the frequencies of these words or terms appear. Themes, the theme is a useful recording unit, particularly in the study of propaganda, attitudes, images, and values. Characters, the researcher counts the number of persons uh, appearing in text rather than the number of words or themes. Paragraphs, because of its complexity, the paragraph is used infrequently as a recording unit. Items, the item is the whole unit the producer of a message employs. Analytic categories must be exhaustive and mutually exclusive. Exhaust exhaustiveness ensures the, that every recording unit relevant to the study can be classified. Mutual exclusivity uh, guarantees that no recording unit can be included in more than one category within the system. Four systems of enumeration, a time-space system based on measures of space, for example, column inches or units of time, for example, minutes devoted to a news item on the radio to describe the relative emphases of different categories in the analyzed material. An appearance system in which coders search the material for the appearance of certain attributes. The size of the context unit determines the frequency with which repeated recording units occurring in close proximity to each other are counted separately. Four systems of enumeration, uh, a frequency system in which every occurrence of, of a given attribute is recorded an intensity system generally employed in uh, studies dealing with attitudes and values. And if you notice, they're driving on the wrong side of the road in this picture. This is a picture from, from England. <laughs> Themes and frames, final step in content analysis involves identifying and delineating key themes in the data. Uh, key themes helps us uh, understand how a phenomenon under study was framed in a historical moment and by individuals or groups. These frames then provide a link back to our starting concepts and theories, which allow one to consider whether our concepts and theories are sufficient or not for the understanding, of, for understanding the phenomenon in question. And that is the end of the chapter. Next week, uh, so next week is the week of the 19th. Um, the semester is supposed to end on the 30th, and I think I have, yeah, it's supposed, it ends on the 30th. So you've got two weeks, uh, in essence, to get things done. Um, I'll, I'll get things up as quickly as I possibly can. Anyway, you've got two weeks. So talk to you next week.